Hey guys, your boy Chili here. Welcome back to C++ multi-threading. Today we're gonna take a little sneak peek at STID Atomic and at lock-free programming in general. Just a little, just the tip, really. Uh, this is not gonna be an in-depth treatment of the topic. That's gonna come later, and it'll probably be several videos because it's quite a topic in and of itself. Um, but on this this series, the, the the beginning, I want to focus on the workhorse fundamental structures of multi-threading and synchronization, uh, focusing on you know building solid code and building it quickly. And uh, in the last video, I showed you that Mutex is very fast for our uh, current use case. There's no need for that premature optimization. And, you know, trying to make code lock-free in general is a recipe for introducing nasty bugs. But there are some cases where lock-free makes a difference. It all depends on the ratio of how much work you're doing to how much synchronization you're doing. Uh, and some, you know, when you can, you want to increase that ratio of work to synchronization, but sometimes it's just not possible. After all, the standard library has STID Atomic. It's, they put that in there for a reason. It is necessary. There are situations where you need it. And in our current situation, the, the, the data structure we have, it's actually really easy to make it lock-free. And uh, so it's not, there's not a huge risk of introducing the bugs. So let's try. Let's, uh, let's show it off. Uh, so what I did here... I have, in the same thing that I did in the last video, I copy pasted my queued experiment data here, uh, code, copy pasted that and created an atomic one, just put it in a different namespace, ATQ for atomic Q. And in main, I added another option to use the atomic Q. So now we just have to change our atomic Q. We gotta change our old Q implementation to make it atomic. So how do we do that? Well, it's quite simple. We include, mm, better, atomic. And then we're going to make our index atomic because that's the thing that has the race condition associated with it, the, the loading and simultaneous incrementing. So how do we do this? Well, we just, it's actually a template. So we just say we want an atomic size t index, and there you go. It's now atomic. Now, the beauty of this is you can put any type in here, and it will make that type atomic. Uh, now, whether or not that is lock-free is another case. That's another, uh, that's another story. So C++, depending on what architecture you're on, there might not be instructions to do a certain operation like an exchange and increment. You won't be able to do it atomically uh, with an hardware instruction. So you'll have to implement it with some other thing like a mutex or something. So by making this a template, you can be guaranteed that no matter what architecture you're on, it, the operation is going to be atomic. There will not be a race condition. Um, and on some architectures, that means that there will have to be some other synchronization, uh, like a mutex. And on architectures that support it, it will use the native lock-free instruction, the atomic instruction, to implement that operation. Now on x86, this is going to have an atomic instruction for doing this, so we should expect a speed up. So, what do we do? Well, now we have, this is atomic, so we can actually... Uh, well, the, the, the operation that we want to do, I'm just trying to find out where it is. Here it is. Yeah. So we don't need this lock guard here anymore. So the operation that we want to do is called fetch add, actually. Uh, so fetch the current value and then add one to whatever is in that memory space. Um, but actually just doing plus plus achieves the same thing. So we'll just do that, and there you go. And that should make this atomic. Now, if we run it, uh, so what do we want to see here? I, the data set doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that we have it queued. So we run it with the queued version to get our baseline timing. So 1.68 seconds is about what we uh, saw in the last video. 
more or less. And now let's change it to atomic cubes. Now we see 1.65 or 66. Try it again. 1.65. All right, so we are seeing a speed up with atomic, but as you can see, it's not it, it like it's not going to uh, start any revolution. It's two, three percent change, that sort of thing. And I mean, since it's such a simple thing to implement here, it, it doesn't make any sense not to do it for this case. But as you can see here, we're not we're not uh, we're not breaking any records. No one's no one's life is changing that much by making this atomic lock free. And if it were more complicated to implement the lock free in here, we wouldn't do it. We would just stick with the mutex. Uh, but this is with our current situation where each task is relatively heavy, you know, a hundred iterations for a light version, a thousand for a heavy version. So what if we made the tasks much lighter? What if it were like Light iteration is 2, and heavy iteration is 20. Uh, now, to balance out the total work time, we want to increase our chunk count. So let's say that now we're going to do, well, let's say we're going to do 1,000 chunks, and the chunk size is going to be 16,000. So let's try this again with Atomic. I just want to tweak these values. I don't want them to be too big because I don't want to sit here waiting for it to process forever. All right, so Atomic queued that takes just about one second, a little under one second. So that's good tweaking for this. Now, what are we going to get when we make this version queued? Remember, uh, you know, we've changed the size of the workload a bit, but it, it's, it hasn't changed that much. Maybe like a 60% change. But what is it going to look like on the queued version? Two seconds. All right. So Atomic now, in this situation, about one second. The queued version takes two seconds to finish. Now that... That is something to write home about. That's something to raise your eyebrows. And you can see why, because now we have, you know, many more tasks, more chunks and more tasks per chunk. So we have to synchronize many more times per run. Uh, so now the, the ratio of synchronization to processing, it's now favoring maybe looking at synchronization as the thing you want to optimize. So... In this situation, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to start thinking about how can I, you know, avoid locking a mutex. Can I start to use lock-free programming, something like Atomics, in my code? Now, at this point, I, uh, I think it would be interesting to look at what actually changes. What is the special sauce that this Atomic is doing that is different, What the end product, which for a compiler, the end product is the assembly code. So uh, we want to peek a little bit at the assembly code, but let's look, let's start by looking at the queued version. So I want to look at the disassembly of this, but I want to look at it, the optimized version, because that's the real thing, right? Uh, so I would like to set a breakpoint here and look at what the actual code is being used for this uh, load increment. Uh, fetch and add, if you will. Mm, so, yeah, I could just run this under the debugger and it should break point there. Except that it won't. And the reason why, and this is, in, this is a little trick you want to learn about if you want to peek at disassembly of something that's optimized, the compiler is going to inline this function. So this function no longer exists. It's been inlined into the place where it's being called. So it'll be inlined into here uh, and this might get inlined somewhere else so it's tricky what you want to do in this case if you want to peek at what's being done is you can do decal spec no inline and that'll say hey don't I is a very strong uh, order to the compiler to do not inline this function and once it's not inlined we should be able to break on the instruction and once we are here, 
we can go view disassembly or go to disassembly. And now we can look at the assembly instructions involved here. So what this is doing is it is first, so this is loading the value in currently stored in memory for IDX, loading that into register RDI. Then this uses this instruction load effective address to actually just do some math. So this loads the value of RDI plus one. It gets the incremented value. And then it's going to store that incremented value back into memory. So RDI contains I, that's what I is. And this, these two instructions here do the increment and then store back into memory. Um, compiler just likes to use load effective address like this to, to move into another register and increment at the same time and then store this register back into memory. So we can see here that there's plenty of opportunities um, here for another thread to start to load this value before it's been, the incremented one has been stored back into memory. And that is why we get the race condition. That's why we have to use some kind of mutual exclusion here to protect this sequence of three instructions. Now, what happens, the interesting story, and the thing that I think we're all really interested in here, is so what does that look like for our atomic version? So we'll put our decal spec known line in here, and then we're going to run the atomic version. All right, so let, let us go to disassembly. And we can see here that this is basically being achieved with a single instruction, lock, exchange, add. So this is the instruction that does all the stuff. Now what, move one into EAX, all this is doing is because the exchange add instruction adds the value of EAX to whatever is in that memory location. So you have to set up what you're adding is, but that's not part of you know the synchronization, right? That's just local to the thread. Those three operations that we had in the other one, those are all done in a single instruction here. Uh, and often what you'll see for atomic instructions like this that do multiple things at once is you'll see they have the lock prefix. And that actually locks a, um, a cache line so that other cores can't access that cache line at the same time. So it has, it has some implications for false sharing and so forth, but this is the special sauce that makes it atomic, makes it indivisible. And I think the exchange kind of instructions, exchange add, they are, they're implicitly lock. Like, I mean, there's no, un, there's no version of them that is not lock. That makes sense. But there are instructions that have both a lock and unlock version. And that's where this prefix really, you know, adds information to the instruction stream. But you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. The, the the important takeaway here is that it is using a very different instruction to implement the same logic when you have a std atomic size D. And that instruction is uh, lock x add. So there you go. There you have it. Interesting stuff. Now you might think that, you know, std atomic is actually fairly trivial from just looking at it. You just make a, a size t, you wrap it in the template, and you just have added atomicity. But there's more to it than meets the eye. Like, I mean, if you look at the atomic header, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, and like I said, we're not going to cover it. And this is just a sneak peek video at this kind of stuff. But one thing I just wanted to check out very quickly is... Uh, let me see if I can find it in here. So yeah, it's actually in the concurrency support library documentation page. You can see under atomic operations, there's tons of things in here. And one of the interesting things that will take a little bit of explaining is something called a memory order. Uh, there are different memory orders that you can use to do your atomic operations and they imply different constraints. They can have performance implement implications. And I think the default is memory order sequentially consistent, which is the most strict one. So we could try a more relaxed 
memory ordering and see if it changes anything for our performance. But I don't think it will on x86. So you can't use, like for the shorthand plus plus, you can't use a specific memory ordering. You have to do explicitly call fetch add. You want to add one. And then if you, the second parameter here, you can add a memory ordering. So you can go memory order relaxed. And so this one says use, I guess, the, like the most relaxed memory ordering. It, you, you, the only requirement is that the operation be atomic. Ordering before and after this operation is you can do whatever the hell you want. Um, so if we run this, if we see a different instruction, then that means it did something. But I think what we will see, fetch add, yeah, we just see lock x add again. So it's the same, it's the same thing whether you use memory order relaxed or whether you use uh, sequentially consistent. But this could have implica implications on other architectures. Specifically, architectures like ARM do tend, it does tend to matter. Um, they're a little more tricky when it comes to this memory ordering stuff. Uh, x86 tends to be very consistent and it, it does a lot of heavy lifting. The, the CPU, the silicon itself, does a lot of heavy lifting. On ARM, it's not the case. So, but anyways, that's neither here nor there. It's just something I wanted to look at myself. Yeah, so that was a sneak peek at Atomic, STID Atomic, and what it can do, and, you know, some of the places where it, uh, where it actually makes a difference. And I want to look in more into depth in the standard library, STID Atomic, and all the support around it. And also, more importantly, in the architecture of lock-free data structures, which is actually the really tricky part. Data structures with more complicated access requirements than our simple queue here. How to how to design them to be lock free. And that's, it's a very tricky topic, but it's also interesting. So I hope to eventually get to that, but for the time being, I want to stick to more uh, solid and more general use synchronization primitives. And we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll revisit Atomics when the time is ripe. Thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more C++ multi-threading.